Okay, let's start. Uh, so, so my name is uh, Paul Amal Raj, as Sir already uh, told you. I graduated in 1990 uh, in Government College of Engineering in Electronics and Communication, so way back. So almost 33 years before I since I graduated. And uh, from the beginning, uh, the first seven years of my uh, career was in sales, completely unrelated to what I studied. But of course, I was selling products related to computers. Um, then afterwards, I joined uh, TCS in uh, 1997. Uh, from 1998 onwards, I have been involved in security. At that time in India, I mean, people didn't know what security was also. I, I got a very early start because out of my own self-interest, I started learning myself. There was nobody to teach anything. So out of self-interest, I started learning myself. And uh, I got into uh, the implementation of security products like firewalls and stuff like that. And OS hardening, etc. So from then, I started going into doing projects for customers or overseas customers on security. At that time, it was still not mature in India. So nobody was going for security projects in India. So I used to do a lot of overseas projects. Then from 2007 onwards, I'm part of the TCS internal security team, basically protecting TCS from adversaries. That's what I'm doing currently. I work in the TCS chief information security officer's office, CISO's office. And uh, I have multiple roles. I take care of the, I had the uh, technical compliance and governance. So what it means is if TCS wants to introduce some new technology products inside TCS, we will have to certify saying this meets all our security requirements. And then we kind of implement those into TCS. Uh, apart from that, I also, uh, you know, uh, am involved in incident response. Uh, you know, field. So this is a brief about me. Um, I would love to get introduced to everybody, but I'm not good with memory, so we'll just get started. Otherwise, it'll take uh, time as well. A very humble and friendly request. All of those you have opened laptops, I request you to close them and take notes in the notebook, because otherwise you'll have distractions in between. So it's a recommendation. So if possible, please do close your laptops. Your phone's on silent modes as well, please. Okay. So how many of you have heard about information security? Was there any session that happened in the last four days uh, about security itself? Or everything was in cryptography and stuff like that? Mostly cryptography. So did anybody introduce you to the concept, basic concepts of security? The three tenets of security, confidentiality, integrity, availability. So all of you are aware of that? Good. Then I can question you. <laughs> so what is confidentiality? Anybody? See, let's make this interactive, okay? And I want you to stop me at any point in the presentation and ask questions. Um, I've been told not to <laughs> move that side, so I'm, I forgot. Um, so you can ask any que any question, okay? It may not necessarily be related to security. If it's possible, I'll answer. Even in security, see, one thing is not all of us are experts. Everybody don't know everything. I don't claim to know everything. I have a lot of experience, yes but I don't claim to know everything. But if there is something which I don't know, I will take down the question. I will write back to Ashwani sir, and then uh, your questions will get answered next week. Okay? So just stop me and ask questions. Ask as many questions as possible. That's important. Okay, now, anybody? What is confidentiality? Go ahead. Perfect. Anybody, what is integrity? Sorry? Okay. So basically your data is as it, what it says. If it's an apple, you don't say it's an orange, it's apple actually, right? So the integrity of uh, information is what we call that. What is availability? Sorry? Accessible to user. So if you have a tool, uh, uh, let's say a website, you know, what's the point in having confidentiality or integrity of the website if it's not available for users to use it, right? So, so these are the three pillars of security, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. I'm not going to get into that because the topic for the discussion is actually going to be on enterprise security, how we normally protect an enterprise from adversaries. That's the uh, topic. So before I get into it, uh, some, uh, some 
uh, tidbits of information I would like to start with. Has anybody of you hear, heard about dark web? So what is dark web? Okay, good. So, what are the other terms? Okay, if, if dark web is something which is not accessible, what are the other types of web that's available? Deep web. Okay, what is deep web? Sorry? Cloud computing. Okay, one on one type of answer. Anything, anybody else? You will have to talk loudly, I have, I think you, you will probably have the same problem that I have. Deep. Service web. Surface web. Okay, no, that is not that thing. Deep web is something, actually I will come to deep web later. What is clear web? Have anybody of you term, heard the term clear web? Sorry? Normal internet. So whatever you see, that is the surface web that you call it is actually called as a clear web, okay. And you would be surprised to know the amount of vast amount of information that we see is just 4-5 percent. That clear web is only 4-5 percent of the internet actually. And anything which is uh, in simple terms that is indexed, you go to Google or any search engine and you click on something and it results in a search, uh, it gives you a search result. So that is the search results are based on certain indexing these search engines actually do something called as crawling. They actually crawl over all the websites which are accessible to get data and give the search results. That is how they do. So this is the clear web. Deep web actually forms 90% of the internet. So that's the majority of the core. That's what every organization uses. Anything, anything on the internet which is protected by, which needs a, you know, some kind of an authentication, a username, password to enter some control is there on who can actually see that data. All that part is actually uh, into deep web. It's not really visible to everybody. Organizations wouldn't want, you know, somebody else, normal people to actually see what their data is, right? So they will only want that access to be given to their employees, their stakeholders, their vendors, their customers, etc. And for that, what they normally do, they create accounts and give username, password, like you have for Gmail, you know, Facebook, etc. But of course, there's slightly, Gmail also is, is, is partially, you know, it's, it's coming into the deep web category because it's not actually, whatever is inside Gmail is not visible uh, outside. Uh, so that is 90%. And the dark web is anything which is not accessible at all. Now, if, you, if anything which is not accessible, then how do you access that? How do people actually access dark web? That's a question. So anything, anything that is not indexed, which is there, uh, out there, but for people to use it, but it's not controlled by authentication is the dark web. And this is very famous and notoriously uh, useful uh, for more for its negative things than for the positive. There are positive aspects to dark web also where it actually people who are activists, you know, who, who are trying to protest against the governments and stuff like that also use dark web for the anonymity purposes because it really gives you a fantastic level of anonymity. But at the same time, unfortunately, this is the web part area that is used by criminals. You know, a lot of people who do, uh, you know, backhand transaction, drugs being sold, weapons being sold, you know, all kinds of human trafficking. Um, you know, there are, there is even murder for hire in dark web, all those kind of stuff. So how do you actually access it? Is any URL um, with a dot onion extension is actually uh, what is actually getting into the uh, dark web area. And you need to have certain specialized things to, tools to access it. One is, have you heard of what is VPN? Anybody know what is VPN? So, okay, virtual private network is a full form. What does VPN do? It's kind of, you're talking about Tor, a 
so VPN also, okay, VPN, what it does is your IP address can actually get revealed, the source IP address to whoever is kind of you're connecting to. VPN is sending the traffic into a tunnel, through a tunnel to some other uh, service so that people who are on the internet will not be able to see what you're sending. So basically you're trying to hide, uh, you know, whatever, not necessarily hide uh, in, in the wrong way. Uh, for example, uh, in, in the organizations, if I want to connect to my office network from home, I will have to use a VPN because that's a secure way of communicating to my office network where so nobody else can actually see what I'm communicating with, with my office. So basically, it's a, it's a way to connect, connect securely. So VPN is one thing and really speaking, not necessarily, you don't really need to use VPN. What is very important is Tor. The reason why VPN, normally people use VPN and then connect to a Tor network is because to first get a level of, an, VPN also offers anonymity actually. You know, there are, uh, he spoke about third party services, third party services are available which actually offers anonymity. Okay. And um, uh, once you connect in an anonymous mode, then you, you know, switch on something called as a TOR network. And uh, once you have the TOR network, what this does is it actually bounces off. See, how the traffic goes, let's say you type google.com, what happens? Your traffic, something basics of networks covered for you guys? Okay. okay. So, so what happens is the traffic actually starts from your laptop, it jumps over to your home router, from there it goes to your internet service provider, then it will probably jump multiple routers before it reaches the Google service. That is how it travels, okay. And along this entire thing, you will be able to trace the entire path of this uh, uh, traffic travel. Whereas what happens in Tor is, Tor everything is actually in the dark web and they, they take a packet, they actually bounce it off different servers so that when it exits the Tor network, the person who actually sees that packet will not know your source, where, where it actually originated because it has bounced so many uh, fields. But in the other network, they will know where the source comes because it only relays the traffic, routes the traffic. Here, Tor, uh, Tor actually, you know, transfers the traffic from one thing to the other so that the previous source is not visible to anybody. That is the Tor. So you use Tor to do that and there are various browsers, uh, you know, one browser is called as DuckDuckGo. Uh, so you use those browser and then you can uh, do some search engines and anything with dot onion extension is something you can start accessing. This is how, but of course, if you, if you want to really try accessing DuckWeb, be very careful. Don't do it from your regular laptop. Even if you want to do it, uh, install a VM on top of your OS so that your actual OS is protected and segregated. You know what VM is? It's a virtual machine separate, another OS sitting on top of the OS so that everything is segregated. Or better still, anybody heard of something called as Tail OS? Tail OS. Correct. So whenever you actually do an uh, switch on your Linux or, or your Windows system, um, you know, anything that you do, um, you know, there is something called as caching paging um, concepts. So when the RAM is not sufficient, there's a lot of data that gets stored on the hard disk, hard drive. Obviously when it's switched off, all that's there in the RAM gets wiped out, right? But what is stored on the hard disk because the RAM didn't have enough space, it was trying to use the hard disk as the extended RAM, things get stored. So really speaking, uh, it's possible to use computer forensics to retrieve that data at a later point. So if you want to avoid being tracked, avoid anybody from knowing what you're using, uh, there is an oper operating system called as a tail OS. Okay, it's very safe. It will not touch your um, hard disk at all. It, you need a USB, you have to install the OS on the USB itself and then start uh, booting from the uh, USB. And once you shut off, there'll be no trace of who's actually launched the uh, thing. So typically, whenever anybody wants to access the dark web, uh, you know, you actually, people generally use a tail OS then Tor and stuff like that, so that there is no trace of it a lot. I'm not telling any of this so that you guys do something <laughs> criminal, because you know, in order for us to protect ourselves from the bad guys, from the criminals, from people who want to do damage to our organizations, we should know how they operate, right? That's the first thing, how they operate, what are the techniques they use. Only based on that, we will be able to employ tools and techniques that can protect us. Okay.
with this, let me get started. Any questions on things that we have discussed so far? Tail OS, T A I L, Tail OS. Okay, actually, before I, I actually wanted to start with uh, something, something else. How many of you have the habit of um, storing your passwords on the browser? It's very convenient, right? It's okay. You can, you can, you can. I, I don't do it because I know what's the harm that it can cause. I want to tell upfront. Okay. Okay, that's it's fine. That's good. So a lot of us do that. And we also sometimes have the habit of sharing our passwords with somebody else also, right? So that kind of habits also we have. But I'll tell you what is the issue with uh, storing of passwords um, in the browser, okay? Let me talk about something which happened in 2021. It's a very famous uh, breach uh, called as Colonial Pipeline Breach. Okay, this happened uh, many, a couple of years back. Colonial Pipeline is, is a huge uh, company in the US. It's an oil and gas company, energy sector company. So what happened was this, this company, actually the business the company is in, they transfer, transport oil and gas through pipelines. Unlike in India where we you know, transport diesel, petrol uh, and stuff like that through lorries or cylinders, gas through cylinders. Uh, in the West, uh, you know, because it has to travel long, long amounts, they've done a lot of infrastructure investment and laid pipelines through which these gas and um, you know, fuel gets transferred. So this pipeline is huge. Uh, it, it covers about 17, 18 states in the US. It's a big one. Um, one day, suddenly what happened, um, there was a ransomware attack on their system. You know what a ransomware is, everybody? If somebody doesn't know, tell me you don't know because a lot of terminologies I'm going to be using. I'm, I'm pretty sure you may not have heard many of these terminologies. I don't want to assume that you know every terminology that you use, you've heard and you know and proceed. So if you don't know something, just stop me there. And then uh, as I will explain what were the terminologies. So ransomware attack, ransomware is something which people will encrypt the data and afterward demand a ransom saying, you know, give me some money. I will, um, you know, uh, give you the keys to decrypt it. So they kind of encrypted a lot of data, uh, but mostly it was billing data. But because though it was billing data, the company did not want to take a chance and they shut down the entire pipeline. Imagine a ransomware, because of a ransomware, the entire infrastructure gets shut down completely, okay? And of course, because it was a ransomware and it's, 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 it's a national critical infrastructure. So what is a national critical infrastructure is any infrastructure which is responsible to run the nation itself is termed as a national critical infrastructure. Every nation has their own. Uh, so energy sector, telecom sector, so various sectors come under the national critical infrastructure. And so because of that, they involve the regulators, the FBI. And uh, I think um, a, a lot of ransom was paid uh, to the tune of about, I think 40 million or something, I don't remember exactly. Uh, it's a huge uh, 40 plus million, I think, was paid in, in, in Bitcoins. Because obviously, you know, these, uh, these uh, hackers, they do not want the money to be traced. So they actually use uh, bitcoins to it's a, it's a wrong conception by the way it's not that bit, you know you can actually trace the, uh, uh, the transfer of bitcoin completely from end to end actually uh, but it's a wrong notion that people have that it cannot be traced um, so they they demanded the ransom in bitcoin and it was also paid okay and they gave the keys back to them and they decrypted the uh, this one the decryption unfortunately because it requires a lot of compute power it took quite a bit of time and 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 the thing was shut till that time. But actually the, the, the guys, uh, the bad actors had only uh, encrypted the billing part of it, not the uh, core infrastructure, but still they took precaution. And when they did the investigation to find out how did this happen? How did these guys in, enter into the organization? We are so secure. They found that the VPN, so I, I earlier told you that we use VPN to log into the com company resources from the remote, uh, from home or anywhere. So a VPN credential of a particular user got compromised 
through which they legitimately entered into the organization and did all this. They, once they used it, they were able to get inside, uh, upload their uh, you know kit, find the gap, find the vulnerabilities in the system, and then they were able to encrypt it. Further research showed that you know probably that uh, you know this this VPN was accessed from a personal system at home. So if when you have personal system, the hygiene, the security hygiene of the personal system generally is not as uh, good as that of an organization. So we tend to, you know, we, we, are, we, we become complacent over a period of time. You know, you may have an antivirus. You don't even realize that the antivirus uh, which you bought uh, could have expired. And you know, you're not getting patches anymore. It, it happens. Some people don't even have, have the antivirus. Okay. So they don't have the basic um, uh, security uh, things that are there. They don't patch the system because of which it becomes vulnerable. So there is a malware called as a stealer malware. Okay, it's, it's very common, very, very commonly used. Uh, lots of PCs get, sorry, you want me to write that name of the malware? I don't know whether it's ER or AR, stealer. Okay. So, Name of the malware is Steeler malware. Steeler is a type of malware. There are multiple types of, I mean, multiple brands, <laughs> if you may call it, of Steeler uh, malware. So this this uh, malware uh, is something. Don't be surprised if you find that in your laptop if you don't have enough protection. So they actually what they they don't do anything. They just get into the system because you store passwords in your browser. They harvest the password. It's called as credential harvesting. Okay, they harvest the passwords from the browser and they simply relay it back to their parent server. And typically these harvested passwords are sold on the dark web. And this is where the you know bad actors scout for credentials. It's a very easy way, right? If you have a legitimate way of logging, accessing a company resource, all you need is instead of employing you know, difficult techniques to get into the um, organization, I'll be talking about some steps which are really tough steps to get into the organization. Um, you know, uh, you can rather simply use some this kind of method to do it. So the reason why I wanted to start with this, because you are actually part of this program, not only you, you should also go and tell your friends to the importance of, you know, maintaining hygiene. That is one thing. Second thing, whenever you have any account, any account, whether it's your Facebook account, your Gmail account, or any other social media account, bank accounts, if possible, I don't know, bank accounts, they may have to factor, they may not. It's most important that you have a second form of authentication enabled, either an OTP or a Google Authenticator, Microsoft Authenticator. If you don't know any of the terminologies, please, uh, you know, raise your hands, I will explain, okay. Authenticator, because I'll be assuming that you know these terminologies and going forward, otherwise, every terminology ex I start explaining, then I will be here for two days. So. Um, so authenticator uh, and, and then you just basically use a second form of authentication which only you have with you right password is something which you know uh, this is something which you have and what is the third factor third type of uh, uh, two fact what you are a biometric part of it that can be used so I strongly recommend you also encourage your friends to do it so that you know even if somebody gets your credentials they will not be able to log into your account. That's the reason you have to use two-factor authentication. Look at this uh, breach that happened, the colonial breach I was talking about. They did not have two-factor authentication. That's probably why they, you know, the guy was able to get inside just with the credentials. So with that, let me start um, this one. Um, now, I think we spoke a lot about bad actors. I will actually be covering a little more about it. But before that, uh, before you want to protect something in your organization, you first of all need to know what you want to protect. What is it that's valuable to your company, right? Without knowing what is it to you, that is valuable to your company, you cannot go about protecting everything. I mean, it's going to cost a bomb for you. You obviously need to know what is valuable to your company. Every company has different things that will be valuable. So yeah, I've, I've actually put in a lot of industries here. Each of them will have a different thing that is valuable. For example, telecom. The core telecom infrastructure is extremely valuable for them, along with the people who use it, right? So if you take banking, 
uh, the financial data that they hold is going to be very valuable because it, the, that data belongs to the customers. And if at all there is a breach, they are they they will have a liability that they will have to pay up uh, because of the breach. So similarly, in various sector healthcare, you know, patients' medical records, which is actually a personal information, you know, that gets they are they are custodians of that data, and they know that's extremely valuable. So a company first of all needs to know what is valuable before you can even attempt to start on the journey to protect yourself. So here are a few things that I have listed. There could be some more, depending on the industry you are in, which could uh, vary. The first one is a brand image. So any company for that matter, if you look at it, every company uh, is there because they want to generate profits. Profits for their shareholders, people who own the company, etc. That's the crux of it. And when you are a, when you start growing from a small company to a large company, and and people actually start recognizing that, you know, based on the brand, they build a certain uh, brand. The value of brand also carries a certain weightage. Now, you know, if you look at it, uh, when you take cars, every car is not equal. You, you have on the one spectrum, I'm not um, berating or anything, I'm just talking of a low-end car. Let's take a, a Maruti, uh, you know, a Swift, a Suzuki car. On the other end of the spectrum, you may have, uh, you know, a Volvo or a BMW, which is completely maybe 20 times the cost of this car. The engineering, if you really look at it, when you actually get into a 20 lakh plus car and a 50, 60 lakh plus car, the engineering may not be all that too much of a difference, but the extra premium you pay because of the brand value that they carry, because you know that these guys provide quality. So there's a certain brand. So what happens if something happens to the company, the share prices go down and everybody who's invested in the company, the value of the company automatically goes down. So that is why for any company, protecting their brand image becomes a very, very important uh, aspect. Now, you have a company, but who forms the company? It's the people, people who work in that company. It's not only actually only the people who work in that company, apart from the people who work in the company, we have the customers, the vendors, a lot of people who contribute to the development of the company. So that is also a key uh, thing in many organizations. Then comes the infrastructure and the facilities for a factory, all the factory equipment, etc., will be important. For an IT company like ours, we have our computers, our data centers, server rooms, our location itself the links that we use to communicate with the customers, that becomes important. Then raw material, raw material, finished goods. Once you have finished, if it's in a go down, you have to actually protect that material also. There are certain threats that can happen for a finished food as well. Obviously, the most important one is information data. So, you know, as, as Mr. Ambani had uh, said, I think uh, last year or the year before when he launched Geo, he made a statement that information is the new oil. You know, uh, many decades ago, uh, oil was considered as most valuable resource because oil is the one which actually makes the world move, right? It's very important for anything to happen. I mean, uh, glow, I mean, the electricity or transportation, everything that's based on oil. But uh, then there is a slight transformation that happened. He had actually made uh, uh, a suggestion or a statement that information is a new oil, which I perfectly agree. In fact, more and more companies, the reliance on information technology, the data, the data analytics part of it is, is becoming so huge for every company today because and and that works uh, what what makes it very uh, important now that you know that what is valuable to your company all the assets that you hold now what is it that you you need to know first of all what is it that you're going to protect these assets from right that is important only if you know what is it that you're protecting these assets from then you will be able to devise a strategy to protect your assets. So I'm just giving a very generic, um, um, you know, threat landscape, which covers all types of uh, threat, not exhaustive, of course, but majority of the uh, key ones which are here. Let me walk through. Uh, let's start with the external threats. I think we've been speaking a lot about the external threats. How do I point it? How do I use this as a pointer? Hmm? 
Oh, okay. So, okay, I, I think uh, let me not rely on this technology that's here. <laughs> so, the, the top left corner, you uh, you have um, uh, something called, okay, I'll come to that later. Let, let's get into the people who are involved. The right side, top right hand corner is uh, different types of uh, threats in the hacking uh, area. So what are the different types of hacking that's uh, possible? Um, so when, when a company becomes big, the competition may want to know what's really happening within the company, right? So they may do certain types of hacking. Uh, it could be a nation state uh, sponsored, a government sponsored hacking. Uh, you, know, um, you know, especially after this uh, Ukraine-Russia conflict started, um, you know, uh, there was a lot of uh, buzz around, um, you know, things that were involved. In fact, the colonial pipeline thing that I was referring to, uh, at the first time, people initially thought it could actually be a nation state actor that had done. And and Russia was, the, the FBI literally ruled out Russia saying, no, it is not. It's actually done for profit. The last, the next one is the unorganized hacking. Unorganized hacking is the one these ransomware uh, guys would do hacking for commercial purposes. Um, then uh, DDoS, what is DDoS? Denial of service. What is that? What is the difference between DOS and DDoS? DOS is Yeah, so it's the benefit of everybody. DOS is when an attack originates from a single uh, system. It tries to flood the, uh, you know, target uh, device. So the target is not usable. So what is the security pillar that's getting impacted by this? Availability. Okay, DDoS is, see DOS at least you can still prevent, it's it's slightly easy to prevent, but DDoS is, it's pretty difficult because it's typically launched from thousands and thousands of assets across the globe, from different IP addresses you will find that attack happening. And and the only protection, um, you know, a proper protection that's available uh, for DDoS is that you take it, take a DDoS protection service from your internet service provider. Because all these internet sub service providers have a huge pipeline. But as an organization, we may have a small pipeline that we have purchased from them. A DDoS, will, uh, this pipeline will not be able to, when I say pipeline, it's actually the bandwidth. I'm not talking of the other pipeline that we referred to earlier. So, uh, so this pipeline will not be able to handle the flood of attacks that come. But the internet, was, they'll have literally unlimited bandwidth. So they'll be able to know and they will be able to stop that at their perimeter itself. That is a DDoS uh, production data theft and IPR. So these are some of the threats that are available. On the left side, APT. APT stands for? Advanced Persistent Threat. threat. Advanced Persistent Threat. So basically when somebody tries to hack into your system, they put a lot of effort to hacking. I mean, uh, they've done some work. Hacking is a very, very niche uh, skill actually speaking. It requires a lot of technical skill, technical ability to actually get into your system. Once you've get into your system, there could be so many, you know, defense mechanism that an organization may employ to prevent, uh, to identify if somebody is breaching their system, right? So what normally uh, advanced hackers do is they actually, they, they um, once they get a foothold in your organization, they will try to uh, make sure that they, you know, ha compromise a few other system so that even if something gets deducted, the other one is there. So they try to persist in the environment. So that's why we call that as advanced persistent threat. So ransomware, we spoke about malware. Spam emails is a big menace uh, these days. It's more of a nuisance than anything else. Phishing is another uh, very important um, form of attack. And I would say this is becoming more and more sophisticated day by day. Um, you know, the way uh, phishing uh, emails are done. You know, everybody knows what phishing is, right? So phishing is uh, somebody sends a crafted email and, 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 and lures you. With, with certain goodies or whatever be the reason and or threat or fear and makes you enter your credentials to seal your, seal your credentials. It could be even simple uh, way that they have a link and moment you go to that link, something can get downloaded onto your system also. That is also possible. So this is an external uh, threat. Uh, in the physical and environmental, I think this is very straightforward. You can disrupt the power. Um, then. Of, so that the organization comes down, it's not able to operate. You have the undersea cables. Uh, you know, many of us, uh, many of them don't know 
that the entire internet is actually powered, I mean, the traffic is going through undersea cables. It's not something which goes through the air or satellite. Everything actually runs through the cables. And all these cables are going, you know, hundreds and hundreds of meters down below the sea. They are all, they are called as undersea cables. So it is possible that any of these cables, if it gets sabotage, it can get sabotage is when intentionally it is done or accidentally also if it gets get, the, the, there will be an internet outage. I think few years back, India experienced, the whole of India experienced that. Uh, in fact, our organization also experienced that when there was an unders undersea breach uh, somewhere near the Suez Canal, the, the traffic which was going from the west of India towards the site. So all the traffic had to be diverted uh, towards the Singapore undersea cable. You know, and obviously when the entire nation is getting driver, everything slows down for the whole country. So that was a problem that happened. Then of course they fixed it uh, in a few days. Fire, you know, we spoke about the goods being stored in godowns. That's valuable to the company. They obviously they need to protect against fire. Fire can be, you know, because of an accident or could be sabotage also. Sabotage, equipment outage, theft. All these are different uh, physical and environmental uh, thrift. Uh, so there are internal threats. In fact, it is said that 70-80% of the breaches that happen are because of internal threats. When I say internal threats, not all the 70-80% are actually malicious. If you really look at it, 95%, 98-99% percent also of them will not be malicious. Nobody wants to do, intends to do some damage. There will be still that 1 or 2 person, 3 person people who will do an intentional damage because of various reasons, you know. The most common one could be blackmail, could be financial gain, uh, people getting disgruntled, you know, that my boss scolded me because of which I, I want to do this type. So, so many other uh, reasons. So, these are all the things that uh, happen because of an internal threat. Uh, the operational errors, so when you, when you work for long hours, it is normal for you to make mistakes, right. So, that those, those sometimes these mistakes could be very damaging. I'll tell you a very classic example of a mistake that can happen. Let's say you have a database administrator or, or some, you know, network administrator, some, some administrator. The easiest one is database, so I, that's why I took that. So, uh, typically they may have access to both a test environment and a production environment, right. So, this guy actually is experimenting something, let's say, you know, drop a table if you guys are aware of what a database query looks like. So, drop a table or something. And he's experimenting on the on the test environment. He doesn't have anything. But instead of running that query on the test environment, this guy actually runs it by mistake on the production environment. What could happen? If the table, because of his access that he has, the table will get dropped. And if you're not able to roll it back, there's a, there's a concept called of rollback in, this, in, in the databases. If you're not able to roll it back and the whole database goes down, we don't know what is the database that got impacted and the organization, that area of the organization could come into a standstill. A very simple mistake. It happens because of fatigue, typically. Configuration errors. This is a classic one, actually. Typically, what happens uh, in the IT environment when people try to do troubleshooting, you know, for them to identify a particular problem, um, you know, somebody had told initially about the confidentiality, access that on a need to know basis, right? On a need to have basis. So, for example, let's say there is a particular resource. And only from this IP address, their access should be given to that website inside the organization. Now, something that guy complains, the other guy who's accessing the web website complains that I'm not able to access the site. So, what these guys will typically do, is it accessible from somewhere else? Okay, and they will change certain rules, uh, you know, to make it accessible from somewhere else. And once it works, something they'll do, it'll work, that guy will start working, they'll forget about this. So, that's a configuration error you make. And that will be available open, which means that this resource is not supposed to be accessed by anybody else, but it's kind of now available for anybody. It's a vulnerability that you expose in the system. Uh, another one is connecting unauthorized devices to the corporate network. Most corporate networks, um, you know, um, today uh, have controls against bringing in personal devices, personal USB disks. Uh, drives and connecting it to your corporate infrastructure. The reason being, your USB sticks may have viruses and malware because of poor hygiene that you guys had, you know, it can have. 
so they are kind of uh, you know prevent that so people tend to do it for various reasons not necessarily an intentional one but for various reasons people can send emails without knowing the actual reason through email i mean confidential data through email or upload uh, through internet sites typically what happens um, you know uh, some people may want today you have a lot of internet resources which actually does quite a bit of uh, translation for you in the sense that not i, I wouldn't say translation uh, you know migration of uh, a particular type of data or or a code from one technology to another you know people may try to use that uh, and when they try to use that they there's a risk of them exposing their internal company ipr to the external website which they are not supposed to have done then there's a bunch of others unauthorized access um you know you 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 uh, again need to know need to uh, have access base but in spite of that people try to uh, access that information unauthorizedly um privilege escalation is something i i am a user but i i will try to escalate myself to admin admin role so that i can access more information so dos we spoke about credential sharing we spoke about credential sharing is password sharing you know sometimes password sharing gets done in an organization because um you know the guy is on leave only he has access to that information and he will say please do it but that could actually result in something uh, you know malicious from happening it's possible that you know at a later date those two guys may fall off there might be an enmity between them that happens and this guy may misuse it we don't know i mean a lot of things can happen so the whole bunch of threats so this is what is the ir threat landscape so you will need to know what is the threat that is there only for each of the threat there is a different way of protecting there are a lot of mechanisms that you can protect i think people are feeling sleepy so should i tell another story ha for configuration errors it's a little difficult sir actually the configuration errors um there are some some configuration errors which we can have security solutions uh in the sense for example uh, let's let's i was talking about the uh you know access from multiple thing so it is possible that the, the solution for that is how do you detect this you can have run scans va scans on a routine basis you know what your existing configuration is you can run a scan on the routine basis from the internet to check if that has changed that is typically done by many uh, you know organization and that particular type of uh, security to the process is called as attack surface management okay that is one way there are other uh, things uh, you know even within the organization configuration need not necessarily be done only on the internet you could have configuration errors that happen within the database and within the thing. Uh, there are uh, mechanisms where you can actually uh, know the uh, if there are you can actually track the hash value everybody know what a hash right i think you've done the cryptography session so you will probably know what a hash is the hash value can be tracked and if there is any change in the hash value of the configuration file there can be a system alert that can be given there are a few ways you should if you know what you want to protect then you can devise ways to protect sure password browser yes the federation doesn't transfer the password from one to the other the technology doesn't work that way so there is um, you know um, there is a tokenization of the asset that's done and only the token they validated this that google will validate if i have done it and they will pass a token to the other side saying i yeah i validated this is a trust layer uh, you know uh, employed between google and the other organization the other organization trusts google so they will never password the credentials that you give to uh, google uh, uh, you know uh, that side it's only a token that gets passed i'll say yeah. yeah so when you are when you talk about this is stealing password from the browser how exactly as far as i know the password is email address stored there and hash can be kept or uh, you know they're not just stored as a plain text file within the browser so so i uh, see i i honestly i'm not an application security guy so i wouldn't be able to get into the details of how it can be done but i will do some research for you and come back to you on that uh, but um, typically see 
you're saying the password is actually stored in the browser. There is some mechanism for the browser to know that this is the password and it will have to take the password and pass it on. When you, uh, when you look at how you want to do a program, that is the mechanism that you need to attack. Okay, you have a malware that is there and that malware should uh, simulate that program that the browser does to do that. That is one way. Another way is whenever this is happening, this information is actually going to be in the memory at some point. Right? So it has to go to the memory and then it, that is that is another way probably. I mean, I'm not too sure about this part of it, but I, uh, I, I'm i just making a guess that this is how it should be. I will come back to you on that. I'll take notes in the meantime. Good question. I missed telling you what you should do. I, I will just, just I'll note down your first point. So there is a tool called as, you have password walls. Password walls. Okay. Today I know that we have so many different passwords to remember. Okay. There is something called as a password vault. And you can use the password vault to store. A very famous one, a freely available one is KeePass. K-E-E, -E, not K-E-Y, K-E-E-P-A-S-S, -S. KeePass XC is, is what is, in fact, our organization uses that as well. So, so some of these sites may have a requirement where, you know, after 90 days, after 30 days, after six, 180 days, you need to change your password. So it will actually generate the password for you. It will be terribly complex. And you can decide, depending on that site's requirement, you can decide what is the complexity that you, how, how the complexity should be. You can just copy this and then paste it into, into, into that uh, browser. And this is an encrypted setup. So nobody will be, and, and it, it employs AES-256 encryption. So you can't break that, at least today. I have one question regarding this topic. Is there a regarding? regarding? The Google Password Manager. No, that's what I was speaking about. It's called, I was talking to you about the password vault. Another name for that is a password manager. It's the same thing. Just two minutes. I'll just quickly go through. Just for, uh, you know, give a base. Internet has evolved over the years, right? 1970, you only had phones and, and probably even the rotary phones. I don't know if, how many of you, you probably would have seen it in museums or something these days. You wouldn't even have seen a rotary phone. So you have something called as a rotary phone. In those days, there, there was something called as, there, even then, in that day era also, you had attacks. People were doing something. What people used to do? And so phone, phone uh, calling uh, SCD long distance used to be terribly expensive in those days, especially international calls. So what people used to do, it's called freaky. Okay. They used to tap the phone of somebody else in between and then do some thing to make long distance call without any uh, cost. That is the type of attack called as freaky. From there, it evolved. Uh, ARPANET is the earliest internet that was available, the first. Network computers is what I should say that could connect various organizations in the US. Okay. So when that came, there was a guy who actually wanted to uh, do a proof of concept. I, that's what I would say. He, he didn't have any intentions of actually creating any damage. So Creeper was the first virus or the worm that was created. What he wanted to do was he wanted to create some self-replicating program. His, his uh, research was to is it possible to create some program which can self-replicate itself? So that gave birth to uh, the first virus called as a creeper. Obviously, when some uh, a threat comes, a risk comes, there will be some solution somebody will find. You obviously need to find an antivirus uh, solution. So the first antivirus is called as the reaper. In those days, that is how it, it happened. Then afterwards to the online world, you know, the Zen Z world, where all the uh, Facebooks, Googles, Amazons, uh, you know, all the social media stuff uh, came in. 
where e-commerce become a, became a thing. You know, every every transaction started uh, happening. All these only in the late '90s, early 2000s, started the boom started happening. Uh, then beyond 2000, you come into connected worlds. I mean, in those days, to in order to use internet, you have a dial-up modem. I mean, at home you don't have something. You never had something called like a broadband. Today it's taken for granted. I don't think so. Today's uh, generation. Uh, you know, youngsters will think how how did even these guys survive in those days without <laughs> internet and stuff like that. I mean, I, you see a lot of memes on those uh, areas. But that is how. But again, if you look at it, the way the evolution happens, the sophistication of crime also keeps going up. Beyond this, we are still not there yet. What is the next major thing that's coming? I think you guys have all. I, no, I think I, I I will give you a clue. It's about cryptography. Since you. Quantum, so that's that's something which is just round the corner. Now, once you have quantum computers, every cryptographic algorithm that is there today will get broken within few seconds, minutes, whatever has. It's not going to take months and years to break any crypt cryptographic algorithm with a quantum computer. That's that's a given. Everybody knows that, and that happened. Now, if that is the case, how are we going to protect future? So there is something called as post quantum so already you know things are uh, um, getting um, invented um, you know made to uh, uh, deal with that era so obviously when there is a threat threat also evolves the protection also evolves both go hand in hand now it's it's it depends on who's going to win the race so that's what it is so before actually i'll spend another next next few minutes um, talking about how you do an attack. The reason why I'm actually starting with this, I, I even started with the dark web and now this is because only if you know how an attack is done is how you can, you will appreciate what all is done for the preventive mechanisms. Okay. Is it visible? The first, I, I will be talking about each of this individually. Um, so the first one is reconnaissance. I'm, I'm just reading for you. First one is reconnaissance, second one is weaponization, third one is delivery, fourth one is exploitation, fifth is installation, sixth is command and control, commonly called as C2. And last one is actions on the objectives. Typically, we call this as the uh, cyber kill chain. Different See, uh, don't worry about all this uh, framework. Maitri is a very famous framework. If, if you can note it down, do your research later, which actually talks about all the tactic, tech, uh, tools, tools, tactics, and techniques, processes, how an attack actually happens for every type of attack that is there. Everything is documented. So let's take this one by one. Now let's, let's take it with an example. Okay. Now, when a thief wants to steal something in the house, so what does he do first? He, we call that as recon. Reconnaissance, in short, is recon. Okay. Scouts, scouts the house. He will hang around the house. He decides the target first of all, which is the target. Then he will hang around the house, maybe even a week, sometimes. Real professionals may even take a month to know what is happening around the house, study the behavior, what all is happening, look at all the possible options that are there, you know, which could be the entry point, whether I should do it in the gate, enter through the gate, main gate, or I climb these, you know, somehow go into the terrace and get an entry from that terrace door, or I am not stolen by the way. <laughs> Okay, so uh, or cut the window and then make an entry. He does all this recon. Similarly, the equivalent of it here, you do a recon. So you ca gather information about a potential target. Anybody, first of all, when you want to hack, you gather because you uh, don't want to get caught. Also, that's important, right? So you gather the potential about all the target, how you can attack the company, whatever is publicly available. You want this is not a phase where you actually starts intruding. Inside. You just 
doing everything outside without touching the systems. And you try to find any vulnerabilities published depending on the fingerprinting, any passive fingerprinting that you can do, you can do that. So what are the, does this organization have any protective mechanisms like firewalls, IPSs, etc.? Are there any third parties that are being used by this organization which through which we can, you know, come? Any other, any existing new entry points? They just do a recon of all the activities. Next phase is weaponization. So based on the knowledge obtained during the recon activity, the, the thief will have to decide, now what should I do? Now should I, if I need to break a lock, I need to find the right, you know, gadget to break that lock. How breakable that lock is. Or does this uh, thing have a CCTV? What should I do? do? Do I use a foam to, you know, cover the CCTV somehow or cut the cable so that the recording doesn't happen? How do I do that? Or do I ma wear a mask and then get inside? So there are various ways in which you can do a plot, right? Or, or if I want to do the, uh, cut the grill, what is it that I will need to cut the grill? different weapons. So similarly, here also, the hacker will try to find which is the right way to enter the organization. So he, he can actually, uh, you know, uh, use existing programs, create new programs also if it's possible, depending on the sophistication of the defense that is there, you may want to create a new uh, program, that is also possible. A lot of preparatory work uh, goes into before you actually attack the company. Once you've had this, you need to deliver this. Uh, now, now, let's say they, they found out, now the attack has to be launched on the target. So either you, how, how can it be done? Typically, you can have an application which is there, which you exploit the vulnerability. If, you know, if, if the applications are not getting patched properly, or if it's not coded in a secure way. That is why there's a lot of emphasis on secure coding. If you don't use the right methods to code it securely, the application could cause buffer overflows and stuff like the different uh, problems and uh, you know that can lead to it being exploited. An easier way, people these days, that is the most common way that people try to employ, is using phishing techniques. You, know, you send a malicious link to the user. Now you send a link like iPhone available for 20,000. I mean, everybody would at least want to click and see what is there, right? I mean, so you get the, you raise the curiosity of that uh, individual to actually click and you'll be surprised at at how many people actually click on those type of links. So you click that link. When you click that link, there's an auto download that happens in the background to your uh, system. A program gets automatically downloaded. And how do you deliver? This is one way of doing it. Uh, we spoke about social engineering phishing. Fishing. Another way very uh, commonly used uh, by people is, uh, some of them use it, is uh, you actually put a malicious program in a pen drive and hide that program. There are ways to hide. Right? Um, and you put it, normally it won't show up in the file explorer. So, and they will drop these USB devices outside the organization, near a tea stall or something. Somebody will, you know, in the organization, they know where these guys hang out, right? So have you heard of the concept called as red team? Anybody? Red team. What is it? Okay. What is ethical hacking? Red team and ethical uh, hacking are two different methods employed by organization to find out what's the vulnerability. Is there any way anybody can actually come into their system? They, the organization themselves will hire these people. So I think that's why it's called as ethical hacking. You know? So they do that. So ethical hacking, it's a very broad uh, thing. You know, they just, there are multiple things where you can have, uh, it's called black box, gray box, white box. Black box, you don't tell anything to the uh, hacker. You just say, uh, let's say for example, let's if it's my company, we will say TCS.com. That's the only thing they will they will give it to you, nothing else. If it's a gray box, we'll give some more information. You know, these are the IPs that you may want to target. 
if it's white box, we can give a lot more information uh, to them. Uh, you know, even even give some authentication and stuff like that, so that they can do a proper complete. The difference between red teaming is also done for the same purpose, but red, the difference between red teaming and ethical hacking is red teaming is red teams are given an objective. They're given a goal, a very specific goal. So now they will say the goal is I have this very secure area, physical area, data center, let's take in my organization. I want you to do a red team. Red team does not necessarily mean only logical all this, it can be physical also. I want you to do a red team to see if somebody can get inside the data center from outside. Some any any stranger can get it. That is one objective. Another objective could be uh, there are some crown jewels we call it in the organization, which are the core infrastructure which supports the rest of the organization. So there is something called as an active directory, which which has the uh, directory of all the associates working, all the computers working. That's typically the crown jewel. You know, it's called the domain controller. Which will have that active directory. So we can give a goal saying breach my domain controller. Because that once you breach the domain controller, you have keys to the kingdom, basically. So you can give a goal, it's a goal based. So once they achieve that goal, they will not find any other uh, issue. That's a different. So these red team guys is a very common technique used by red team to drop USB uh, drives outside the uh, T stall where this common. So people will pick up what they will do as soon as they come, first thing they want to see what is inside, right? They'll plug in. The moment they plug in, a program gets loaded into the organization. That is why most of the organization will block USB drive on our physical assets. In fact, today morning I told Arun, my USB is blocked <laughs> in the morning I was telling him. We wanted to transfer a program, so I was also telling him about it. Okay, so did I miss anything in the previous slide? Okay, I think we've kind of covered. DNS, I think there was something called as DNS poisoning, right? Anybody know what is DNS poisoning? So it is. So basically, if you type google.com, this, my browser will contact a DNS server, something called as a domain naming system, DNS stands for domain naming system. And it will contact that server to find out what is the IP address. Because all communication on the internet happens only with IP address, not with names. But we have names because we can easily remember them. I can't remember, if you give four IP addresses, impossible to remember Google, Gmail IP address, every IP address, right? So that's why you have this. DNS poisoning is uh, something where you interpret that uh, communication and actually give the false information instead of giving the actual IP address, you give some other IP address where you store malicious files which can be downloaded. So that's DNS poisoning. Then next one is how do you exploit? So once the thief comes in, uh, you know, um, you, have, you have to find a way to get inside the um, uh, home. So you'll have to exploit whatever the door or once he's there. Obviously, there could be surprises. You could that, that the house could have an alarm, you know, which can go off. You need to be prepared for all eventuality. So that is how they also once they come inside, it's possible because there could be a lot of defenses that is there in the organization which could trigger alarms. So they will need to have tools and mechanisms in place how to avoid detection. Basically, do everything silently. You know, typically the most professional hackers they will do things silent, so silently that you will not even be able to find things that are happening. They won't try to create noise. Okay, noise is something which generally people create who are, you know, script kiddies or activists who actually want that attention. Uh, you know, those are the ones who do it. But really people who come to the objective of stealing something, they will not create. I, I would actually put um, every bad thing that happens from the logical perspective, from the cyber world perspective into three different buckets. These are the main three main buckets that I can actually think of. One is government, state sponsored, you know, one nation attacking the other. For example, you know, we could have neighbors who are, uh, who wants to cause harm to our, 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 our interests. The second is uh, commercial. 
purely commercial. I don't have anything else. I don't care. His aim is only to make money out of this. You do a ransomware or you steal data, steal uh, you know, programs and sell it to somebody. Purely this one. Third is the activists. You know, people who will not uh, do any harm, basically. You know, they will just, most, most of the time, they will actually do a defacing of a website and put a banner there and then go. Or, or cause a denial of service, those kind of stuff. They are all activists who want attention to a certain cause. So if you look at every type of attack that happens, they normally fall only under these three uh, buckets. So generally the commercial guys, because the aim is only money, they generally they'll be very silent. Even the government, nation state actors, they actually go into a different league altogether. They are the ones who uh, do APT. So you can do some research and see what is APT-10. Okay, it's actually Cloud Hopper, APT-10. APT 14, APT 29, APT 41, I think, 41 or 42. You will find that all of them actually point to one single state, nation state. Anyway, I don't want to name states, so I'm just not getting into that. Um, so once you get inside, you will want to see how we can move into the organization to other areas as well. So once you have into the organization, and you've landed, um, I think this probably uh, is something which the thief may or may not do. This is typically done only by hackers because they want to come again. So they actually install, uh, see, typically the hacking is not done in just one day, two days. Once you take a foothold, sometimes it can actually, the whole thing can take months together. Bef uh, uh, earlier, at least, the ransomware attacks used to be like you send a link and you click on that link, some program will get executed and your systems all, all of them, and it has the ability to, uh, you know, uh, spread like a worm in the uh, system. I think that is what happened with this. There's a very famous uh, ransomware called WannaCry. Okay. It, it exploited a Microsoft vulnerability by which it actually spread inside the organization and then uh, you know, encrypted every device that it could find which was vulnerable. Um, but these days, people come stealthily, they remain, gather all the data and slowly exfiltrate. Even if you exfiltrate in bulk amounts, you know, organizations have thresholds. Beyond this, if you see some link going spike up, they will know something is wrong and start investigating. So they have these thresholds, uh, you know, they want to, they do, they do not want to break these thresholds. That's why they're very silent. But at the same time, they want to come back and do this again at a later date because it, it's, it's months together. So they install backdoors. If, and if one, um, you know, compromise system is detected, they would want others also, you know, they actually compromise multiple systems in the organization and have backdoors so that they can come back into some other system. There are different types of uh, malware, dropper, downloader, etc. I'll move on. So once you've downloaded the um, application into the system, these guys are sitting remotely, right? So they'll need to have control from the remote. So these programs immediately connect to the command and control center. We call it a C2 in the cyber world parlance. So once they communicate, the attackers will be able to come back, give instructions via that program as to what they need to do next. Once they are inside, uh, we spoke about different objectives, you know, data theft, encryption, exfiltration of data, it's the same as data theft or any targeted attack, any mass attack. Mass attack is, you know, uh, encrypting thousands of uh, systems in the organization completely paralyzing the network, etc. Finally, the monetization. The commercial monetization is where the commercial part will come in for those who are selling, selling this information, asking for ransom, blackmailing, common things that happen. Um, recently, I think this was about uh, just three weeks back. Um, there was a post in the dark web um, uh, from, I think, if I'm not wrong, it's Lockbit. That, uh, you know, Boeing's 
Boeing is a you know the, the airlines manufacturer. Uh, it's not only about airlines. It's it's about they actually do a lot of defense projects for the U.S. also because that's why there are a lot of sensitive information stored in Boeing. There was a, a notice in the dark web saying, you know, we have this information, your information, and uh, if you don't pay up, we're going to expose this. So it was there. Not everybody resorts to blackmailing threats. So I think uh, Boeing didn't uh, heed that. And um, uh, there was another one saying that we have published their data a little later. So I, I mean, I don't know. They probably assess what is critical, what is not critical, and took the decision. I know it's, it's, uh, it depends. It will vary from organization to organization. Some of them will decide to pay up to protect the data. Some of them will say no. They'll, they'll know whether it is, you know, for example, to, uh, last week on, I think, our own uh, very, our, this is public news. Whatever I'm saying is actually only public news that I will say. I won't say anything which is not in the public domain. So Taj, group of hotels, there was a news that uh, said that uh, uh, there was a ransom. It's not a ransomware. It was only a ransom demand that somebody had actually accessed and got hold of a lot of mobile numbers, addresses, and stuff like that about the customers. And, and, and it was a very paltry amount, actually speaking. I was myself surprised how come somebody is demanding such a small amount. Only $5,000 were asked. And um, I, I don't know, the statement from Taj is, we are still investigating this is what, uh, we are, we don't, our data is safe and stuff like that. So I don't know what happened to that uh, part of it afterwards. And the other one I spoke about, the colonial pipeline, by the way, I think most of the Bitcoin that was transferred was recovered. I don't remember the numbers, but I think uh, I think the demand was for 40 million or something. I don't know. I think at least about 17, 18 million got recovered. I think quite a bit of it what got recovered. That's why I said it's it's actually possible to track the. So once you are inside the organization, so we did a recon when you're outside. Now, after you're inside the organization, you will, the, they will, because from the outside, you may not know what is inside, what are the tools that this company is using, what are the defense mechanisms that are using. So, the, uh, the attackers will actually do another recon after coming in and only then they will try to launch uh, this one. They will try to do a scan of the systems that are available. What could be a, a protection? Let's say you come inside the organization and somebody is trying to scan the network. Typically within the organization, you don't have firewalls in between uh, to you know segregate things. Some organizations do have, uh, who are, whose security uh, implementation is on the higher side, they'll have multiple firewalls within the organization also, but some of them don't, most of them do not have. So what could be a protection mechanism to identify if somebody is doing the scan? IDS, then you'll have to install IDS on all the networks. IDS is normally installed on outside network. I'll, I will be talking about IDS in detail. Yes. How will you monitor? It's not very easy to monitor that. Logs will be checked, but uh, typically scan logs is something. Um, See logs, what happens, I'll tell you what happens with logs analysis, it's a certain threshold that you set. Okay, only when, oh, one second, let me answer that question. When you, only when you break that threshold, let's say within five minutes, I see so many thousand scans, then I will treat it as a threat. And the, only that will get traced as an alert. So that is how the log, because it's impossible for you to look at because logs that are getting generated within an organization will be in you know gigabytes terabytes sometimes it's not possible to monitor all the logs but there is a very simple mechanism um, log monism with the proper threshold yes but there's a very very easy mechanism that's i'm coming to a normal easy one have you heard of something called as honey pots simple honey pots are systems which has a lot of vulnerabilities, right? I mean, there are various, honeypot is a term used in different uh, fields in different ways. In the spy field, it's used in a different uh, terminology, it's different altogether. But in the 
IT parlor in the cyberspace. Honeypots are something which is meant to divert the attention of the attacker so that I know that somebody is trying to attack me. Because this will have vulnerabilities. The moment somebody finds there is vulnerability, you try to go and try to exploit it. Right? So you have these honeypots in every network segment within your organization. So that if somebody does a scan and you monitor only these honeypots. If a scan hits the honeypot, it means there is somebody really trying to scan the entire network. It's as simple as that. So if you have 10 networks, all you need to do is put 10 honeypots and scan only this. Otherwise, monitoring the entire perimeter, entire network becomes a little resource intensive as well as from the data perspective, it's a huge shift. Okay, uh, this we're talking about people will do a recon and after that he will find how I can, because he's already gained foothold into your organization. That is why that part is not there. The infiltration is done. Then how will you do? Lateral movement. Once you've gained access on one system, you can't be sitting there simply. You have to actually move across different system to find the actual where the crown jewels are, where the data is. Then after that, you also have to ensure that you can be persistent. Because if you're found, this, this system gets found, I need another system from which I can come back into the network. And afterwards you do data exfiltration. This kind of sums up the entire way in which an attack happens. Next phase will be to go to the uh, protection mechanisms. Any questions? I, I actually find it very odd when somebody calls me sir. <laughs> I'm not used to it. People, I, I like to be called by Paul, but I, I understand. <laughs> Hi. When you have honey pots in a network, right? Uh, as an organization, would you actually use those honey pots in sort of production environments as well? Or like, because it's, it's, it is production environment. It has to be on the production network. But Be then somebody was looking at it. As an adapter, how would I know whether I'm attacking a honey pot or not? Because obviously, that's the precise, the, that is why the defense is there. We, do, we want the attacker to, we want to lure the attacker to the honeypot. But then won't you also be putting like user data or product? No, because once I lure, I know where the attack has come from. So I know which system the guy is actually using. So I will immediately isolate that system from the network. That is our intention of doing this. And does that answer your question? Yeah. Anything else? Any other question? Fine, let's move on. Now, it's a little bit dry, <laughs> so uh, mostly technology and terminologies and stuff like that. So, so whenever you design, so uh, see, anything that you need to design and have always, you need to take a risk-based approach. Okay, what is a risk-based approach? At home, let's take a home environment. What do we do? If you have, let's say, a lot of jewels, and I, I, I think that there's a lot of theft that's happening in my community, in, 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 the, uh, in the surroundings, what are the steps one can do? You do a risk analysis immediately. Am I protected? An obvious thing, you can buy a safe, which is uncrackable or whatever, and then have it. But nothing is foolproof, right? So another way people do, but depending on the risk that they have, the risk appetite is what I should call it as. One's own risk appetite, depending on the amount of assets that you have, you devise your protection strategies. Or I could take all these jewels, go and keep it in a locker. That's another mechanism I can employ. Okay, I'm not saying it's 100 percent say, but that's a mechanism which a lot of people do. And that is how do you make that decision, I want to use that locker, is because you decide that you have certain risk and I want to protect my assets. It's not only the gold, it could be even your documents. Not necessarily it has to be always, you know, assets which are valuable, like, you know, financially valuable. It could be, or even, okay, documents are also financially valuable. It could be, you know, documents that you want to keep protected from fire at home. There's a risk of fire. Keep it in the locker. So those kind of uh, stuff. So you will, first thing that you will need to do when you design a secure architecture is look at all the risks. That's why we spoke about all the threat that is there in an organization. Once you know what you what you what you have to pro, uh, protect, does this threat apply to them? People, what could be the threat for people? I I had people as an asset also. 
people can become malicious, take data because they are, they are inside, they have access to the kingdom. Okay, so that is one. So what do we do? There are things that we do to avoid that. We do background checks and stuff like that. So everything that you want to do, every strategy that you employ, need not everything need not be only technical. It has to be a combination of technology, processes, and procedures also. So all these things will have to be taken into account when you do a design. So when you do any design, the design should always be on secure architecture principles. Now, it is not enough if you just take the logical. If you think I'm protected only by the way of uh, protecting my uh, logical kingdom by putting firewalls, IDSs, whatever, uh, then you may be mistaken. There could be a guy who is actually going to walk in with a USB stick inside the organization and plug it in. That could cause a damage for you. So how do you protect against those? That could be an outsider who may suddenly just walk in. You have these ID cards, yes, but ID cards can always be printed, right? I mean, those tags you can steal from somebody, you can print those ID cards. Very easy to print these days. Not difficult to find how it is. You can print and then, you know, walk into the organization. So what are the mechanisms that I will employ to? Many organizations have multiple layers of security, yes. So, NFC is uh, NFCs, uh, yes, NFC, NFCs, see all cards are generally proximity cards. Though it is not based on the NFC technology per se, there is some kind of um, you know proximity sensor that will be there. When you take the card very close to it, about one centimeter, it will read what is there in the card. Kind of the NFC technology. Um, biometric is not a very feasible solution for large organizations. Uh, in the sense that you put the fingerprint there and the fingerprint will have to travel back to the server. It takes time to read. The queue will get formed. For example, let's let's take my organization itself. But for small organization, absolutely agree, biometrics. Or you have to employ a technology where the biometric itself is stored in the ID card. There's a, there's a chip that can be there in the ID card. Okay. So that chip can actually, if that chip can actually store the biometric itself, and then when you do it, it reads, am I the person? Because you have given it to the authentic person. So that way, that is another way of doing, that will save a lot of, but again, there is a processing involved. So it's a decision that you have to take depending on the inconvenience that you want to cause or not. There are other ways to handle. Multiple ways, um, you know, in which you can do identification. Randomization is a very important factor here. You randomly verify tags with the photos and stuff like that. And security guards are very much trained uh, actually these days. I mean, though the, you think that they're not looking, they look at the people, they, they know, they, their eyes are kind of moving always. You'll be able to pick up the right uh, person. So yeah, physical controls also you should have, but today's topic is not about, I'm not going to touch on the physical uh, thing, but just to give you a brief, what are the things that you can have? Obviously, CCTV is one thing which is absolutely mandatory. Uh, then many of them, uh, even because of the threat that happened to one of the large IT companies in Bangalore, uh, where there was a bomb that uh, threat that was there. I don't know if it was found or I, I forgot it happened a few years back. And after that, every company has, uh, you know, implemented when the car comes under carriage checks. The guard will put a glass under the carriage to check if it's a bomb there or not. And all the bags that are taken into the facility will be scanned via x-rays. All these mechanisms are there in many companies, many large companies. Um, so uh, then obviously ID cards, even if you have ID cards, the ID that you swipe at the first door will not give access to every door that is there in the organization. It will give access to the first door and only to the other door where you are supposed to sit and work. So that level of compartmentalization you can these are different things uh, that, you know, from the physical security perspective that you can do. But here the focus, everything is going to be on logical security. So this is how a security architecture blueprint looks like. So typically any policy that you want to break, okay, that's fine. 